You're listening to DraftKings Network. Welcome to the Big Sui, presented by DraftKings. Why are you listening to this show? The podcast that seems very similar to the other Dan Levitard podcast. I'm sorry, I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> in fact, the only difference seems to be this imaging. I have been tempted in restaurants just walking past tables to grab somebody's fries that if they're just there. If that hasn't happened to you guys? I've done it. And now, here's the marching man to nowhere, fat face, and the habitual liar. I really do need some help from all people involved here at what is happening with fashion and style. And I have to, on the front end, say I am nobody to critique anybody's fashion or style, but I am confused by something that is presently happening. I told Tony this the other day, where my wife bought me a pair of sneakers and I'm looking at them and I say when I see them, I would never wear those. Those are sneakers that when I was a young boy in the 70s, if I wore them, the other kids would make fun of me. And my wife is like, no, these are popular now. And now everywhere I wear those sneakers, somebody's saying, those are popular now. And what I'm seeing Tyler Hero wear, I'm not joking when I say this, when you say that 90s hat and that style is now back, my childhood neighbor, Roy Collins, a construction worker who had a tumor the size of 14 bowling balls in his belly, drank a dozen beers a day. That's the hat he always wore. That that hat is what he was walking around the neighborhood with. And I don't understand how that's popular now. What sneakers did she buy you? Oh, I don't know. They were Nike Dunks, if I remember correctly. Uh, They're they're Nike. They're Nikes, yeah. Nike. (laughs) They're Nike. So Rivas or Nike? Um, <laughs> Only no, a few people get no. that. Only a few people get that reference, Daniel. But if you do, it's, I nailed it. He was very inside. Yes. So I don't know that that the shirt is necessarily in style. I mean, maybe it is because Tyler here is an NBA player who's wearing it. But I do think something is going on with fashion where that's going on with a lot of other stuff with with entertainment with movies, music, is that the 90s and the 2000s, this nostalgia for that time is what's driving a lot of the things that people like. And I think now this hat is a perfect example of like someone finds that Tyler here was born in 2000. He's like, oh, look at this old hat. But to you... Well, this, this is, is what, a, but, this what, what, what I'm Roy asking Collins you. I'm, I'm at, thank you for remembering. The guy his with the tumor. Uh, yes, it was a giant beer belly, and then we later found. So out was it, it was a, tum- a tumor? Oh, it was a tumor. yeah, well, yeah, well, oh, it was, yikes! Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. That, Poor but, Roy. But this could he, be a tumor. He was always shirtless, and he was always wearing the only the only cloth on the upper half of his body would be that hat. Uh, but I'm talking here, and I don't know if these if I'm not going through two cycles of fashion. I'm talking about seventies. Coming back in the 90s and coming back again. Are these now? Yes. uh, Yes. These are now the cycles that every generation latches on on the front end of the thing that was popular in the last generation. Yes. And, And not only did the 70s come back in the 90s, but the 70s and the 90s have come back. And then we went past them and we went to the 2000s with low rise jeans, which throwback jerseys are inevitable soon. Like that was the biggest thing in the aughts was everybody wearing a throwback basketball jersey like the Sonics or the Vancouver Grizzlies or one of the still in. They they were in. But like at music festivals, I'm telling you, I think that's the next thing. Throwback football jerseys, throwback basketball jerseys. They're going to come back in in this time because everybody's nostalgic for the. When are Timberlands coming back in New York? They never left. Never left. The official shoe of New York City. He's the Timberland, the Timberland boot. Wheat, by the way. Unless it's summer or winter, then you hit the all black. But the point is, Dan, there is such a demand for vintage clothing, vintage accessories, vintage gear, that people are making millions of dollars going through old, like, storage units, people's grandmother's houses. Like, there's people that find stuff from 1994, like those hats that actually came out in 1994. Yeah. And people pay two, $300 for a hat like that. I spent time on my honeymoon at a vintage shop on purpose. I bought this watch at a vintage shop because... On purpose? Yeah, on purpose. I like thinking that you would go in there by accident. Like, oh, you oh, could just kind of stumble into it. Shop. You could stumble into it. We, oh, we you know, you walk along watch. the street. Hey, cool, a vintage shop. No, we went out of our way to find that place. Uh, uh, Jeremy, go sit in the penalty box. Samson, what were you saying? I'm sorry, you were laughing at everything there. Uh, what were you I, saying? I'm just laughing. People 
are hoarders. And what they do is they say, hey, it's going to come back at some point. So I keep all the clothes that I've ever had waiting for something out of style to come back in style. But what was Trump that is Tony thinking that anyone is making millions of dollars by going to their no. storage unit. You, it's not. Dave. That is total hyperbole. Dave. They are. There, there are massive vintage shops that people are making millions of dollars a year, 100%, guaranteed. Uh, yes, the vintage industry is doing very well. That part is true. I think David's objecting to the idea of finding it in an old storage unit like Greg Cody going out back, finding right. a, a 1994 Orange Bowl briefcase that they gave him, Ooh. and all of a sudden that's on Antique, he's a millionaire. Antique Roadshow, and he's worth $3 billion. No, of course, of course. But it's, it's a, it's a a grind though you got to go to the thrift shops you got to get it you got to clean it like there's a process to it but the people that dedicate their lives and that's their business is going out and finding these vintage clothing articles like they're making good money there are every city has a, a specialty vintage person and, and business who's going out and finding these things like mr throwback in new york city uh actually my friend has one game day grill date was going so you well. There. It was going well. You were Game. so confident. I was and you were soaring. With my chest. I, well, well, it was. You were parasailing. I saw you. You were floating <laughs> the near gust the of sun. Wind that dropped all right I, into a building. And, yeah, that's what happened. She just flew right into the sun. We'll get back to Charlotte's uh, jumbled thoughts on this in a moment. What is the movie you're reviewing for us this week, David? I let you go, and I forgot to ask you. I'm reviewing Project Iceman. Project Iceman is about an individual who went to Antarctica to do an Ironman triathlon, where you swim 2.4 miles in the freezing water in Antarctica, then you bike 112 miles on the snow and ice, then you run a marathon on the snow and ice. And it took him about 74 hours to do. The speed of the bike was slower than your three-year-old on a tricycle because of the wind and because it's just impossible to bike. He kept falling off his bike. Ugh. And it's a movie about the experience of someone who's unwilling to quit. And it got me thinking about how many of us have that reserve in us to accomplish something. And if you're looking for motivation or if you're looking to think about doing something that you don't think you can do, Watch Project Iceman, and it will absolutely motivate can you. Can you explain this to me for a second? Because I don't think I'm built like you. So when you say that motivates you, <laughs> I say, no, I'm a quitter there. I don't need to pedal a bicycle like that, and I don't have the mentality to even understand what you're talking about. For those who do not know, David ran uh, seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. He loves this kind of stuff. I don't understand punishing yourself like that, and I do understand trying to reach beyond your limits, but th what you're talking about here sounds so unpleasant. Why would I want to do that? Because it, it's momentary unpleasantness for a lifetime of accomplishment. So that's how you have to view when I did the Ironman or even the marathon last week. I cried during it because my body shuts down, but then you finish and you have that sense of accomplishment. And when you have to do something work related or athletic related, everybody quits. It's the people who don't that you want to associate with. It's the people who understand the grind who you want to associate with, who make your company better or yourself better. And <laughs> athletics funny. are a way it's to fun, test that. It's funny that you say that, though, because I'm just looking around this room and I've thought to myself, I ride with the quitters. Like, I got a whole bunch of people here who aren't down. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I got a whole bunch you of people. you see our faces and I, we're all like, you know, ah. we're like, no, all of us were like, wait a minute. He got off, he fell off the bike how many times and he's pedaling up the wind. And what? Why he ran a marathon with the big what? shoes on, like what? those big ice shoes. Yes. You know I mean? no, yes. Ronald McDonald shoes. Like what? What are Rackets we? What, on what, feet? what, like, what, what are we this? doing? What are we doing? The, the, the fact is that you're more capable of doing things than you realize. And in a workplace atmosphere, wouldn't it be good, Dan, to motivate your container, your employees, to let them know that they can be better than they are. They can do more. There are no limits. I don't know though that I see talking into a microphone as similar to running in the snow. Do it's a frozen the commitment ice man, to excellence. That, that's what it's about for me. It's oh, but I, but, I, I, but I would argue as well, though, that somewhere in there, now this is deeper than that, and this I don't know everyone's mindset on this stuff, but I also think that you have a bit of a commitment to suffering. <laughs> so, and, 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 you, and you might conflate those things, that you can't get one without the other. 
I, I don't conflate them. I acknowledge that. I don't believe that you can get to greatness without suffering because you need that frame of reference, much like I don't think you can get to happiness without experiencing sadness. You have to have a frame of reference. And doing these sort of athletic things that I try to do that anyone could do, they definitely give me a frame I, of reference when I'm being lazy either at work or at play or in a relationship. I don't think anyone can do them, though. I think it's a very specific, like, my back would give out in two seconds, but it doesn't mean that I'm a quitter oh, in be, my job. I'd be super interested to sort of see if there were any viral strain that ran uh, amid all of these extreme personalities to get you to the roots of what it is that uh, – that feeds this because it is a pro the Iron Man competition is a particular mindset. Very few people in the world are built to be Navy SEALs, David. No, I'm just talking about it doesn't have to be an Iron Man. It can be a 10K for some people. That's the mistake that people make here. I don't care if it's a 30 hour event, which I've done before, or if it's a 30 minute event, which I've done before. It's about getting out of your comfort zone and doing what you don't think you can and then realizing that you were wrong about what you're able to do. That's why I like these athletic endeavors. So the turkey trot, 1998, I'm nine. And I was like, maybe foot races just aren't for me. But do something else. How about going? How about doing a hundred mile bike ride? Mm, mm -mm. Hundred miles. <laughs> it you there. don't strike me. I don't. I may have you wrong here. I don't know you this way. You don't strike me as aggressively competitive. Well, I am. It's just sneakier, and you don't know I'm doing it. David is aggressively competitive in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Like, I played ping pong against him once, and I, I wanted to run away because it felt like a spider monkey. Who won? Was, uh, who won? He did. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I was just sort of terrified of how competitive he is. I don't, I, I don't like that. That all stems from, if we're going to get on the couch for 10 seconds, that stems from being bullied and made fun of because I was so short that I chose sports where I could beat the bigger kids without them thinking I had a chance to be good, like dodgeball and ping pong or darts or things like that because I couldn't beat anyone at basketball and I couldn't hit a baseball. So I got really good at sports that don't require that sort of size. So does that mean I'm going to get hyper competitive, David, with, because of bullying? Uh, go well, sit. you've got the go, sunglasses. Go, go, Do you have an eye infection, sit, Jeremy? Sit, no, I'm fine. Get out of here. I'm go fine. Sit, go sit in the penalty I'm box fine. again. Go, I'm fine. Go. Get out of here. David, I think I can maybe beat you at darts. I I doubt that, but I any time I would I'm love really to play. I'm really good at darts. I'm good at darts too, and ping yeah. pong. I'll take you in ping okay. pong. Stu got in the corner just ripping darts though. <laughs> oh, I, I, Chris, I think you'd lose to him in ping pong. I'm pretty good. I, I'm well, not, I, I bet he is good. I'm just saying I'd I, like to play I him. I think you'd lose to him. In we ping should pong. do a metal arc Olympics of darts and ping pong. Okay, All e right. everybody here would be terrible. Uh, thank you, David. Good seeing you. <laughs> the Dan Libertard Show with Stu Gatz is sponsored by BetterHelp. We all carry around different stressors, big and small. When we keep them bottled up, it can start to affect us negatively. Keeping things bottled up can feel like carrying a weight that gets heavier with time. Whether it's talking to a trusted friend, journaling, or seeking professional help, finding ways to let out your thoughts and feelings can bring relief and help you navigate challenges more effectively. Remember, it's okay to reach out for help when you need it. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash DLB today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash D-L-B. Don Lebatard. Your history with him suggests three years of Those petering the out heaters. there. Yeah. <laughs> three years of heaters. But this Stugatz, my partner, enlivened by a sports We're team. having sex, baby. <laughs> and Joe Maurer. Yes, like this is the best version what? of him. Uh, what? That's, what? Stugatz. No, you are. Yeah. The, 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 Feels Stug good. This is the Don Lebatard Show with the Stugatz. Come on. You're going to tell me that wouldn't have been funny if Dolan had just gotten a bunch of firefighters and police officers and just in a train sent them that way so that we can have a battle between Philadelphia and New York about who's better to people? Who's, who's first, who's who's first, first? responders are first? <laughs> no, do you think James Dolan would ever do that, Dan? 
I don't know. He, I didn't. No. Th- I didn't think I'd find myself in a scenario where the Sixers are playing one of the biggest games I've seen from the Knicks this century, <laughs> and they've got to buy fans in order to keep New York out of there. That's not something that I had on the bingo card before the playoffs started. That is so embarrassing for Philly fans. Philly fan. Philly fans who punch horses in the face. Police horses in the face. Talk about first responders who who throw batteries. The fact that they needed to be bailed out by ownership to buy tickets, like, or did they, or were they going to buy them and they just jumped the shark by being like, you know what, we're going to get all of you in the seats. Could you imagine if that happened in Miami, the way that the national media would respond to the Heat fan base? I don't think Charlotte used "jump the shark" there correctly. Well. I think you just threw a jump the shark in there, and that's not the proper way to use jump yeah. the shark. Do you even hmm. know the reference you're making? Do you know the reference you're making when you say jump the shark? Is it from Jaws? It's yes. a good guess. I mean, it is a reasonable guess. No, it's from the Meg. No, it's not. No, it's from Happy Days. Is it? Yes. I don't believe a single thing no, anybody's saying it's, right no. now. So you, so wait, you don't know the what? <laughs> what do you think? Hold on, let's backtrack yeah. for a second. What do you think jump the shark means? Mm, If I'm being honest, I'm not totally sure. Okay, so you talked without knowing what words mean at a live microphone uh, internationally. Well, but it felt good, didn't it? The way that I said jump the shark well, there, it didn't that me sound my, it natural? It stopped me in my tracks and stopped me from talking about a pretty good game. It was game. smooth, though. I, I mean, well, yeah. if you're not listening to her. I had a history teacher once who was like, if you don't know how to say something, say it fast. And the way I feel about sayings like that is like, if it feels right, toss right. them in. Let me explain something to you that just swept over me with what I'm going to say is the haunting delight of warmth from the spirit world. It's that seat. That seat will turn anyone into him to help me. Dan, now that you say that, I feel like every seat in this studio, yeah, there's there's a sense of like... There's like a spirit, and I don't want to. Uh, it know? smells like cigarettes. It, there's like a and, something. There's like a and, tinge of something. And greed. It smells like cigarettes and greed and laziness. But if you put it in that seat and mix it with the ingredients of whoever it is, it gives the gift of saying things that it doesn't know what those things mean. I gotta confess something to you guys. I've known for a long time that I've had more stugats in me than anybody here. Really? Oh, yeah. Jessica thinks uh, she's Sugats. Jessica has done some some Sugats things. You're oh, yeah. applying for the position of no, being no, no. more Sugats than Sugats? No, no, no. No, not at all. I would never do that. I'm just saying there are things, you know, when you're like Stugatz tries to get into places or, try, you know, tries to finagle or is like, well, uh, You're a snake charmer? Well, I say jump the shark without knowing what it means. Yeah, and you think it's charming. What does it mean? Okay, so... Happy days. Imagine a time when there were three networks. Hmm. And imagine for eight years everyone gathering around the television at an appointed time because this was the number one show in the land. And it was the number one show in the land because the big star of this show was a man who was cool because he wore a leather jacket. The Foz. He. The, the Franz? Fonz. <laughs> <laughs> the German version, the Franz? <laughs> I did not think I did not think she could do better than the Foz, which was her initial offering. Wait. But then it became the French television show Happy Days with the Franz. <laughs> what is it? It's such a good show. I could conquer. I watched it. I, I've seen I, I could conquer. No, no, no. Wait a minute. I could conquer French television show uh, television right now. The entire. Land I could conquer by putting together a hit show from set because you guys just told me the seventies are super popular again. A hit a hit show with the coolest guy in France, the (laughs) Franz. He wears a beret, but so anyway, it's Tyler Hero, but with a beret. (laughs) So you have. You have a television show that's the number one in the land, and like all television shows that are hugely popular, the moment they go on the road, they travel. Watch Entourage. Go to Vegas. Uh, That's when the show's dead. And the Fonz 
in what was seen as the time that that show went from being good to being shitty, number one in America, to this show sucks. The point in time that that reference is, is Arthur Fonzarelli water skiing and jumping over a shark while wearing the aforementioned leather jacket while water skiing. Oh, and that no was way. the point that the number one show in the land became a show that was then at that moment, as he was over the shark, okay, that's when it became a shitty show. Wow. Oh, look, we have, what, look here, amazing work. <laughs> amazing wow. work. By, uh, truly amazing work by our video crew. Here it is where television went to die, right here. Arthur Fonzarelli, look at him, clearly him. It's not a stunt double, that is clearly Henry Winkler. <laughs> uh, he did all his own stunts back then. And <laughs> and, so that's, and w right there when he lands, that yeah, that's when the show died. So, Dan, really? you were watching and you were like, hell yeah, dude. What, a, what an episode. I never understood. I was always asking my mom why Fonzie was so cool. I didn't understand the, the leather jacket. The coolest Jew who ever lived, Arthur Fonzarelli. He's going he's gonna to be Betty White for us. He, he is. is. He, oh, my God. He already is. It, Henry it, Winkler is is our favorite American old person, I think. He kind of took that lane of, like, every time he trends on Twitter, everybody's worried that he's dead. I feel like Dolly Parton's up there. Ooh, Dolly Parton she, is up there, but she doesn't... But she doesn't... Across as old mm -hmm. because she has a youthful spirit. That's right. Also, I definitely used Jump the Shark wrong, if that's what that means. No, you did. Well, did I, though? Did I? Because if you think about it, so the ownership, the Sixers ownership bought tickets for fans so that they try to have not fully Knicks fans at a Sixers game, which is deeply embarrassing. So they kind of did jump the shark. They went from like Philly fans were good fans. And then they were like, we need to buy you tickets. So they sort of jumped the shark. I think she might that. have backed into it. No, I don't think so. I, not, I mean, if if she can argue her way into it, the initial point that she's making, though, can we can we address this part for a second? Philadelphia is a great sports town. Everyone says so. Standard, unreasonably high. The Phillies just won 20 games last month. They matter again as well. Philadelphia has spent years losing with this team to play a basketball game tonight that is yet another referendum on the process, and I cannot wait. To me, this has been the most interesting thing that exists in the playoffs. This, what is happening in that series, where I look at both of those teams, I'm like, there's not a lot of difference here, and if Joel was totally healthy, they'd probably win in the playoffs, because if you have stars, you win in the playoffs, and Brunson can go 8 for 29, because it gets harder when you're the guy who's mm -hmm. got to do all the offensive stuff this is a giant game it's philadelphia huge. is playing tonight and their former owner if you guys don't know some of the history on this michael rubin of fanatics is going to be he already is extraordinarily wealthy but he's gonna be in bezos territory when he is done with what he's doing which is leaving philadelphia ownership because he wants to run the world with money he made so many relationships that you you guys remember that uh, white party right uh, just uh, guys get this because every celebrity in the world was there and he had all the marketing people around to send out all the cool videos that told you Michael Rubin has arrived in the Hamptons and has arrived in sports and has arrived at the playpen where the richest of the rich want to play. This guy is a former owner of the Sixers, but not just that. He is really good friends with Joel Embiid. Like, he did that for Joel Embiid. That's not being done for Philadelphia. Joel Embiid complained that he was pissed. Joel Embiid is saying, what is this? It's a great sports town. Michael Rubin is his friend, and he just bought 2,000 first responders for Joel. I, Joel needs some help tonight. Let me see what I can do. Uh, that, that, for you who do not understand who this human being is, okay, because he got to sports briefly, didn't want to be a minority owner, was not going to be a minority owner. Like, this is a conqueror. This dude's been making giant deals since he's 14 years old. And he knows how to build relationships, and he got out of sports because this is what he wants to do. He wants to be Bezos and Zuckerberg and Musk of sports, like whatever that is, and he's going to do it. And he just bought Joel Embiid a whole bunch of cheers, a whole bunch of friends. I mean, it's hard to argue. I do want to say I have great respect for Philly as a sports town. I have great respect for Philly fans. I'm not saying I like them. I'm just saying that as someone from Boston, as a Boston fan, I would be wildly hypocritical to sit here and be like, oh, Philly fans suck. Like, you know, you got to have a shred of self-awareness if you're going to be the, the person to, to bring Boston 
to the national media stage. Put it on the poll, Juju. They're not enough of us. Worse fans, uh, worse sports fans, uh, more obnoxious sports fan base, Philadelphia or Boston. But to me, what the Knicks fans did by going into the Wells Fargo arena the way they did was not as much a knock on Philly to me as it was like, look at these Knicks fans. Like these guys are, they, they, these people are showing up. For their team on the road. But why would we do it the positive way when we can do it the negative way? Oh, that's a good point. In today's America, the best way to do this one is this is not to celebrate Nick's fandom. It's to say what Jeremy was saying. Philadelphia, if this happened in Miami, where you got to buy for a playoff game, a, a playoff game that's a referendum on the process because all you got left from all that losing. You used to be a franchise that competed with the Bostons of the world. Uh, Iverson dragged you up there by himself, but you haven't mattered like that. You've been laughed at for 20 years as a basketball city that's supposed to have a history, because it does. Fo 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 is Moses Malone. Uh, you had Dr. J, and now this version of this team, the best it's got is a broken Joel Embiid who needs the, the past owner to buy a bunch of fans for him so you can fill your stadium. You should be embarrassed as a sports town on that one. And Maxi to be incredible for the entire series. Yeah. Like, sick, hurt, doesn't really matter. He's just dropping 30 points a game and hitting clutch shot just game after game after game. You after mentioned game. sick, Tony. Charlotte came in here today. And I, I really do believe somehow that this is underregarded all the time in sports. Jamal Murray shouldn't have even played in that last game. If that was a regular season game, he wouldn't have been playing. He had to beg to get out there, and then he wins the game. He, make, he wins the game. For Luca to beat the Clippers last night, mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte came in here this way today. She's like, he was sick. I would have called out. Well, if I, I was that, that kind of sick, well, if I Twitter. felt. That, if I no, but if I felt that kind of sick, she's saying I wouldn't have come to this job to do this today because I would have wanted to heal. Maybe I should do some more like ice triathlons to get tougher. But no, I mean, first of all, I think you know talking is different. I'd be like, well, I'm just going to get all of you sick. I'm going to sound stuffy. Who wants that? Yeah, but please don't. Come I didn't in if you're say sick. I wouldn't go in if I were Luca. I say I respect it greatly because when I'm sick, I'm a giant baby. Okay, fair enough. It's a good distinction to be making. And you are telling me that as you walk into the room here, you're worried about getting us sick. You think Luca is looking and saying, I don't want to get Kyrie sick? Like if Derek Jones Jr. gets sick, they're like, hey, don't get Luca sick. But if Luca's yeah. sick, he can get Derek Jones Jr. sick. Luca is the top of the sickness pyramid. Who's in the middle? Like the one where we're not sure. If you're sick, I gotta I gotta ask Carlisle. PJ Washington. PJ Washington. Oh, no, I was gonna say, yeah. Gafford. It's Jason yeah. Kidd. Now, Carlisle's in India. You idiot. Go, in, go, where? Did go, you say Rick Carlisle? Right. You, he fell apart. Oh, go Tony. sit in the penalty box. He's not oh, in he, India. He's in India. Just, India. Get, just yeah. get out of here, okay? Oh, Chris leave, said it. Leave for two I minutes. never say that. You lost your confidence in the middle of what it is that you were saying. <laughs> we're undermanned today, and people keep going to the penalty box. Like, I feel like I'm playing hockey two on five. This is a power play. It, uh, but it not feels for like us. A, no, no, that's power what it feels play by like. Dan. It, power it, play it, on us. No, but it also feels like Stugatz is making a power play on me by just decimating my surroundings so that we miss him. Because tell me you didn't notice this, people. I know we were playing around with it on air. I haven't seen this spirit here since 1999 on Stugatz. Sports grabbed Stugatz by the balls yesterday and shook him. And he was surprised by the whole thing. Like he got, he got sort of disoriented because he didn't know he could care about sports enough to have his heart broken he again. He was sexually by, awoken by, by yes, sports yes. again. Yes, look, he I want, was. yes, I want you to imagine. You talk about Dan, you talk about boring sex all the time because tone, it's like, oh, you know, the tone, tone, tone thing. Then it's like, whoa. Tone, I want you to imagine just a cobwebbed nether regions, just everything cobwebbed, oh. everything, and then Gross. it's shaken to life, just shaken to life by Joe LMB. And Ma Maxi, Ma Maxi did that to the entire Knicks fan base. Yes, tasered the Nether regions. Whoa! <laughs> Oh, that's gross. The last time that he felt this excited, he said he came in here saying, oh, when Joe Maurer was elected in the Hall of Fame, for whatever reason, that one is the only other this, one that woke him I, up. This is what I'm telling you, and it embarrasses me to say this because I didn't see it until after it had happened. The fact that in the last three years, the only thing Stugatz has cared about around here at all is that Nick's loss and the Hall of Fame entrance of Joe Maurer 
That's three in three years. It's the only two things that have lit a spark. Oh, he cares about something. He was alive. He was shirtless in the parking lot. <laughs> it's crazy. I, don't, <laughs> it was, uh, I walk in and he's he, like, well, and it's the news. He was humping the passenger side tire of my car. Like he couldn't. Get out of here. He was, <laughs> he was. It was like a fly around an elephant's tail. I miss that guy. I had him at the beginning of his career back before he cashed in. <laughs> the, the draw was so powerful that I wasn't on the show yesterday, and I was like, I need to be in the building to see what Stu Gatz is going to be like. And it, it delivered. He's going to be so scared tonight, and it's going to be so fun to watch. I, I don't know that there – I don't – what's second place for interesting – on what's happened in the postseason when you have two of the weird games in that series that are decided at the end and you're watching this part this part matters too it's a very predictable sport by and large it's usually the top four seeds with few exceptions we get to game seven on the road and then the home team wins uh but i think we're all in agreement ah those two they're, they're kind of the same like either one of those teams can win that series, and if Joel were a little bit healthier, my guess is he would look a little bit better. The variables are so different, though, Dan. That's what makes it so interesting. Yes, it could go either way, which is why it's terrifying for Knicks fans, especially because they had it in the bag, and because the variables for the Knicks. First of all, they're missing Randall. They're missing another shooter, but they also have Jalen Brunson, who actually, for once in that franchise's decades of losing. They feel a confidence with him. If he's on the court, they're like, oh, we have a chance. Like, we can actually we can actually win this. The Sixers are dealing with sort of the other side of that. Joel's falling apart. He is not panning out to be—I mean, he hasn't been to Eastern Conference Finals. He was the hope. He was the process. He was what we were supposed to trust. You're watching that disintegrate. So it's almost like— the Knicks are on the up, the Sixers are coming down, and they're meeting at this sweet spot where Tyrese Maxey can be the difference. Don Lebatard. Teammates can't shoot from three. Now they're going to see a different Jimmy. Now he's just, just playing. Nickel back in the locker room and... Stugatz. They'll play D and shoot threes as they chase the Nets for the six seed. These five words in his head. Scream, are we winning games yet? This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugatz. I actually think that the two most interesting things in this entire playoffs is Embiid's injury and that thing, and then Knicks and their fandom and all that craziness. But the next most interesting thing, Dan, is a series nobody's watching. I think it's Cavs magic. Yeah, it's been so good. <laughs> There's no way. It's been so good. They had good. to tell you what the score was yesterday. I'm not saying I'm watching it. I'm just saying I think that's the second I, I most di- interesting I thing. I disagree with Jeremy. It has not been so good. Oh, it's the, competitive, the, Dan. No, that the fifth game was competitive. All the other games. Look, this is a change in basketball you better get used to, and it's going to stink. It's going to kill some of your viewing habits. The buzzer beaters in the close games, uh, there are going to be a lot of these 30-point disparities, a lot of these 20-point disparities all over the place in these games that aren't as interesting as you'd like them to be because you'd like them to be closer. Like the, the, the amount of scoring in that league makes it so that Dallas is playing a game five yesterday and you're like, this isn't even an interesting game on the road. You're, or, this isn't, this, I'm, look, I'm watching something here that I'm, I, I don't think this is interesting. I feel, though, that in the, I, my hope is that in the later rounds of the playoffs, that starts to go away, that you get more of Nick Sixers. I mean, Nick Sixers should not have been a 2-7 matchup. But because Embiid was injured uh, all, uh, some of the season toward the end, when he's been healthy, they've been overwhelming. Like, that's not – that's a thing that's so. It's statistically so. I they, I don't know if they were the best team in the league while he was healthy, but it was the Celtics. I think they and, were like 30-8 and eight or yes, something like that. They, they were very good when <laughs> – when he looked like somebody who was completely unstoppable. But you guys are talking about something, and this to me is the most interesting part of the series because you're sitting here saying uh, that the conversation is about all this Knicks fandom and what's going to happen with Embiid and slithering into the crevices there is this is where Maxi becomes a superstar. Like
like this is how it happens, where another guy comes into the mix. You're watching, and everyone's watching now because I'm telling you what's happening now. A whole lot of people are getting to their televisions, if not for the first time, but around, and they're like, holy shit, Maxie's faster than everybody. Everybody. Maxie is faster, and then he becomes his most improved player on the year, and he's bailing out. A, he is giving Embiid and the process another game because he has uh, the fortitude to sneak into that crevice and make a shot from 30 feet. Um, you can you can make an argument that Maxi and a healthy Embiid is one of the best one-two punches in the East. Like oh, yeah. I'd put them up Definitely. there maybe almost better than Wait, Brown though. and... You wouldn't have done that before this run. This is where this stuff gets made. Like this is wh- this is how this is how Maxi makes me maximum wrong in the comparison between Maxi and Hero. Where they were when I was talking about this, I did not allow for the jump. I've been watching just as as you are that Maxi's faster than everyone for two seasons. More of a leap for me. Um, it was more of a leap than a jump. I think it's a leap. A jump is. Definitely not. He's a become hop. elite. He jumped into the elite category. Oh, so you have it as a jump. Yeah, jump. I, I think nope. it's a leap. A leap into elite. A well, leap he... is better than a jump. I think so. In yeah. sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A is leap. there anything better than a leap? Well, in while literally, I feel like a leap is less than a jump. But in sports, a leap is no, more no, no. than a jump. A, a leap, catapult. A leap is horizontal. A jump is vertical. There it is. Okay, but and a... and Maxi has leapt forward and jumped. What is that? Wait a minute. What do you mean he's he done has, both? He's gone horizontal and vertical at the same time, literally and figuratively. So he's a, the most improved player this year. A leap and a jump. A, a lump. We got to get check those. Who's won, <laughs> who's won the most this playoff so far, Anthony Edwards or Maxi? It's a great conversation because we always talk about who's got what to lose going who's into the postseason, and and you know it's always hey Kevin Durant's going in and he could lose this on his legacy or Jimmy and Bam they're doing that or whoever, and we don't often talk about who's got a lot to gain just by winning a series. Both Maxi and Edwards nationally have solidified where they stand within all of these guards. Because I don't think you know it until it starts to happen. Right. I don't think until an ant starts to go off, until Maxi starts to go. Like, if you've been watching the NBA all year, you know these guys are incredible. But for people who come to the playoffs, they're like, oh, Anthony Edwards is him. And it's like, that's when the stakes start to come in. That's when they're but easy. I- yeah, I think because we projected Anthony Edwards to be here, he just took a step this year. Oh, okay. Like because he was so Ooh, he was step. already so far up in our eyes that that's just a step in another step in the like we kind of saw this coming. While Maxi was a leap, I don't you know, know what, what happened there. You know what? what I think wait, people... what? Wait, what's going on? I've been trying Chris, to talk. Chris, all right. Why, why are you having so much hard? I'm having such a hard time with it today. Well said. <laughs> so much hard. <laughs> Let I, me. Circle. I can't talk for more than twenty seconds. If I go for more than twenty seconds, something bad is going to happen. <laughs> so you're going to jump the shark. I want to go back to the criticism I'm getting most loudly because I don't think there were a lot of other people saying or having the bad analysis that I had. There are a lot of people the last couple of days who've been reminding me, and I don't think anyone else, hey, Levitard, remember that thing you said about Tyler Hero being as good as Maxi? Hmm. Because I did say that. Yikes. It's a bad take today, but look at where and how it became a bad take because the take was being made. I saw Tyler Hero, the one time he played in some of these games, score 37 points in the bubble against the Celtics, and whatever it is the growth of that was supposed to be, hasn't had the playoff games that Maxi is presently getting to show everybody, no, this is what growth looks like in this circumstance. Maxi hadn't had those games. He had them this season. Tyler Hero had one of those in the playoffs, and then I'm thinking Bam and Butler are getting in the way of him being able to have more more of those because this person, and this is not up for dispute, has made scoring when healthy, Tyler Hero, look easier than almost anyone who's ever played in a Heat uniform as just a scorer. And it has not grown. It did not grow while Maxi became the most improved player. And then you've got this added bonus. Man, oh man, Jalen Brown, if he backs you down in the paint, Tyler Hero, they're just going to hunt that because Tyler Hero is going to get stuck in his ass crack. Tyler Hero took a jump, not a leap. He no. did get better Whoa. as a player. No, no, no. I was thinking he went the other way. He I was trying to think. Well, he, was better, yeah. he was better this season than he's been previously. The problem is, is that his one chance to be the one 
was against the best team in the conference that's going to do this to everybody. Jalen Brunson's going to be the number one on the Knicks, and he's not going to win more than a couple of games against the Celtics. What is the opposite of a step? Like, I, I know you can say someone like regressed. Like a sink? You sank? Oh, he sank. Like a backtrack? A backtrack? Yeah. Oh. Backtrack. Yeah. Oh, hold on a second. A hold on a second? <laughs> yeah. No, it's what? Uh, wait, oh, wait no, a second. We, no, we oh, I thought you were no, telling no. us to hold on. Yeah, no, uh, like, uh, uh, wait a Jeremy, second. Jeremy, go, 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 <laughs> play in traffic. 